Hello everyone and welcome back to Water Child Tarot. My name is Sarah and thank you for joining me for this part two of my series on tarot numerology, um, specifically looking at reconciling imagery in the RWS. Um, I'm not going to re-explain what I'm doing here. Uh, all the information you might want is in my initial video on the ACEs and there's a pretty generous preamble there and explanation of what we're doing. So I'm going to dive right into the cards. Um, I will just say for this video and the next two in the series, um, because I'm doing multiple numbers, I am going to, after I talk about each number individually, I'm going to look at the prog progression through those numbers. So today we're going to look at twos, threes, and fours, and then we're going to look at how those progress through that little section of, um, of, the, of the pips. All right, so let's take a look at some cards. And here we have our twos um, as they appear in the RWS. We'll start with the High Priestess. And the Golden Dawn um, key phrase for the High Priestess is the Priestess of the Silver Star. Now that doesn't really mean anything to me. Again, the Golden Dawn was a secret society and I haven't studied their ways and means. So um, we don't really get much from the title of the card, but of course we get the imagery with the two pillars and you know the female presenting figure seated here um, with a veil behind her and you know any any tarot book is going to go into a lot of depth about what all these symbols mean and what she represents and all of that i will say um sort of relevant to our discussion today is that weight refers to her as a portal um, she is the means by which one can gain uh, secret knowledge. And so I've, while I've heard her sort of negatively represented as a gatekeeper, I don't view her that way. I view her as, as a communicator and as a means to learn um, and to study, but from the point of view of nonverbal communication from the point of view of intuition, from the point of view of insight gained through direct experience that doesn't get put through your verbal processing center. So I might talk about that more in a little bit, but as a, as a sort of a gateway, I think that can apply to the other uh, numbered cards as well. If we look at the keywords for these cards, here we see um, some difficulty in, in, at least in my mind, in reconciliation. So um, the Golden Dawn phrases for these are all the Lord of whatever it is, but I've just cut out the little keywords um, and put them here because that's a lot easier to read on screen. So our keywords for the twos are Dominion for Wands, Love for Cups, Peace Restored, for swords, which is an interesting thing because it's like restored from what? We just had the ace and now we have the two. And if the ace wasn't a problem, it wasn't unrest or something, then how does peace get restored in a, in a sequential way? And then our two of pentacles is uh, harmonious change. So harmony or change, uh, peace, love, and dominion. Dominion, love, peace, harmony, or dominion, love, peace, change. Um, and I've seen different decks interpret um, this Two of Pentacles in different ways with, with different keywords. Those, those things don't quite go together. Love and peace work, love, peace, and harmony maybe, um, but love, peace, and change is kind of weird, and then change, dominion, and love, and peace is even weirder. So this is what I'm talking about when I'm trying to reconcile the images that we see with some kind of pattern, some kind of recognizable commonality between these cards. If they're all labeled two, why are they labeled two, and what is two-ness about? So um, in my own sort of, again, study and practice of the number two, um, we have the concept of duality. So push and pull, light and dark, yin and yang, this and that, you and me. Um, you know, it's like a seesaw. He said, she said. Um, two, uh, two poles on a magnet. Tom Benjamin talks about the magnetism or repulsion. You know, it can be attraction or repulsion in that sense. And uh, there's certainly a, a kind of a balancing going on. I think a lot of people interpret the, um, the two of pentacles just from the image as a balancing act um, even though that word balance comes up in both the temperance and the justice cards as well. Um, it's sort of all over the tarot. But um, visually, it looks like he's trying to juggle or balance two things. All of these people have two objects that they're trying to 
in some way incorporate into what they're doing. So that makes sense. But I see it more as that push and pull rather than actually holding uh, two things very well. It's it's sort of having to make a decision or having to um, be put in a situation where you realize there are two choices. Kind of getting back to this idea of um, the high priestess, um, realizing that <clears throat> there is this concept in in it's a very central concept in Buddhism called interdependent origination. Um, and if we think about going back to my discussion on the aces, where you have a, a seed planted, right? A seed does not get you an oak tree. An acorn does not get you an oak tree in a vacuum, right? The acorn has to be in the right kind of soil. It has to have water. It has to have um, the right causes and conditions, the right temperature. You know, if a squirrel comes along and digs that acorn up and eats it, then that's not the right causes and conditions to get an oak tree. So, you know, the thing, whatever the thing is, and then the causes and conditions to support that thing have to come together. And so that's another way that I look at twos. And going back to, again, to the high priestess as a gateway, um, you can kind of see see that represented in the other cards. Maybe not quite as well visually. I think this one's a little more gateway-ish than these others, but symbolically I see these as gateways, opportunities, opening up. You know, you think about the, the two sides of a door frame that you can walk through. And I also see this as, um, again, going back to the high priestess, a chance of nonverbal communication, um, a chance of reading a situation or another person um, without them having to speak to you. So again, I think the high priestess gets a lot of um, flack for being, you know, secretive and guarding and all of this. But I don't, I don't think that's the case. At least she's not that way for me. She's just someone who doesn't necessarily talk to you, but she does communicate by other means. She holds a book sometimes or a scroll, and there's all this this implication here of nonverbal communication. Here you have two people together, um, you know stepping towards each other, offering, posturing, holding objects, holding out objects, you know, there's a lot of communication happening in this card. And our two of swords, um, through readings more than anything else, I've come to think of this card um, in some ways as a card that tells you to listen. Um, but not just to listen to words, but listen to yourself, listen to your environment, you know, cut out the noise, and let your intuition um, and your subconscious kind of talk to you. And, and so that kind of energy also shows up in this, in this Two of Swords for me. On the sort of, you know, negative aspects of this card, I do think we can get like silence or miscommunication, that kind of thing. There's an instability here because there's only two things. So it's either this way or it's that way. It's my way or the highway. Maybe there's a winner and a loser, that kind of thing. So it can be unbalanced in that sense, but it can also be supportive also. So you can have melody and then backing harmony, for example, as another um, sort of another analogy or, or example. In thinking about that pause and listening and you know, maybe waiting for something to come to us, uh, we can also look at the hanged man, which is number 12 in the RWS Trumps. And while I don't necessarily love this as the compliment to the High Priestess for historic reasons, um, I tend to read the Hangman more as uh, a punishment or something like that. But here the, hang the face of the Hangman is very serene. And, you know, I think the modern New Age interpretation of this card is very much about pausing, uh, reflecting, you know, changing your point of view, perhaps, that kind of thing. So again, we get this idea of listening, um, paying attention to nonverbal communication, allowing our intuition to speak to us, quieting the noise and tuning in, and taking a pause in order to really let that information come to us. Um, so, you know, it, it does balance out there. Um, I also want to do some comparative uh, imagery from other decks. So again, we have the Tarot of Mystical Moments here, and we have the Two of Cups and the Two of Swords. Now, I really like this Two of Cups because um, this looks like two of the same person, and so it gets away from that, oh, the Two of Cups is just like the Lover's Card thing, um, 
with it with it being about love and it is more about duality it's maybe the two sides of us or um you know feeling two different ways about a situation or something like that um, in the two of swords again we have someone who is not blindfolded but they have this foliage around their eyes they're not visually seeing or getting information as far as we know but they have a hole in their hat um, which is the home presumably of these two birds and so they're sort of listening right they're open they're they're receptive to information coming into their mind if we think of swords as air and as reflective of the mind um, they're receptive in that way so just some interesting imagery um, from that deck and here are some cards from the Mara Lune Tarot. Um, I like this Two of Cups because it does hint at this concept of love. Again, the two figures have their eyes closed, and but here it's a little bit more ambiguous as to what the relationship could be. So certainly they could be lovers, but they could also be brother and sister. They seem to look related to me. Or, you know, is her hair blue or is it gray? Perhaps that's mother and son. Um, there's a number of different interpretations you could lend to this. So love, uh, companionship, a, a, a strong emotional bond with someone that's not necessarily romantic love. Here in the Two of Wands, we have a guy with two walking sticks, and he's walking up this hill. Um, and this reminds me of a friend of mine who walked the Appalachian Trail um, a few years ago, and his trail name was Two Sticks because he used two walking sticks at the same time rather than one. And I like this idea of um, using the using the sticks as walking sticks because it's you know, it's that thing that propels you forward, right? But you still have to go kind of left, right, left, right. So it's that duality, it's that push and pull creates that forward momentum for you. And then finally, for our comparative look at the twos, we have all four of the twos from the Gaian Tarot. This is one of my favorite decks I've mentioned many times, and it's really informed my view of numerology and um, how to see that in everyday life. So I love all of these cards. I like that the two of fire is um, more about maybe passionate love or sexual attraction um, than this two of cups with a woman and her faithful dog. So that's more of like unconditional emotional support, right? Unspoken love um, that is just uh, shown in other ways. Um, we have the two of air woman who's just quietly sitting and she's she may be taking her pulse, I'm not sure, but she's quietly sitting with her eyes closed, listening. So again, that idea of, of the twos as withdrawing from verbal communication for a moment, taking that pause and listening. And perhaps you can tie that in again with the hanged man here. And then this two of earth is probably my favorite two of earth, two of pentacles of all time. Um, here we have an adult with twin babies and one is crying and one is sort of skeptically looking at the viewer you know like what's going on why are you taking my picture why are you looking at us or what's wrong with my sibling why are they screaming their head off in the grocery store um so you know again it does it does take into that account of balance and juggling and you know um trying to reconcile or trying to have harmony between two opposing forces um but yeah those are some of my favorite twos so next up in our progression, we have the number three, and we start with the Empress, um, who for many people uh, represents sort of fecundity and you know physical abundance and um, and things like that, and and certainly I would agree with that. Um, it's interesting to me that from this three we get these words for the Golden Dawn keywords. So. Um, they are strength, which is a weird one to assign to a minor card when we have a major called strength. Um, I guess the Golden Dawn still used the older term fortitude, but to me still it's it's weird to have multiple keywords on, or the same key keyword on multiple cards. Um, strength, abundance, okay, strength, abundance, yeah, good. Uh, then sorrow just gets thrown in here randomly because all swords are bad. Um, and then material works, or in the Toth, I think it's just called works. Um, so again, no relationship really between maybe strength and abundance, you could say, but even that I think is a stress a stretch. They're, they're sort of both positive, but a lot of something is not necessarily a, a strong something. So for my way of reading, my main keyword here is growth. 
I love um, Ryan Edward, and I think he actually got this from Camille Elias originally, you know, growth and hope that it's benign, right? Because growth is painful. Growth is difficult. Uh, it takes lots of resources. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of concentration. You know, sometimes you're forced to grow by circumstances that in ways that you didn't really anticipate or want to, or you weren't ready for or whatever, but now this thing happened and now you have to grow through the experience. So it's not all like hugs and kisses and love and abundance and pregnancy and, you know, your vegetable garden overflowing with vegetables, although it could be any of those things too. I also see it as a, a third coming in for support. So as the twos had all this duality and push and pull and my word against yours and that kind of energy, when you bring in a third party, suddenly things kind of can stabilize. Um, and that third party can be an arbitrator. They can kind of help both people who are, you know, not not seeing eye to eye, um, kind of see the other person's point of view. You can get a second opinion, you know, maybe it's you versus your doctor, and then you go to another doctor and you get their opinion on the situation. Um, so that that's one thing. Um, I'm also reminded about a, f a favorite movie of ours called About a Boy. It's based on a Nick Hornby novel of the same title. And there's a point at which this, um, you know, it's a single mom and her um, teenage son, and they're having a lot of problems. And Marcus observes, you need three at least. Like two's not enough, you need three at least. Um, because his mother's having some mental health crises, and, and as a, a young teen, he doesn't really know what to do for her to, to help her, but he knows that she needs help. And he, so he feels like he needs another adult in the situation, right, to kind of step in. So um, I think about that. Uh, with threes. And certainly we can see that, you know, in the three of cups in particular and the three of pentacles where you have three individuals and they're kind of doing something together, working together, celebrating together, uplifting one another, um, maybe critiquing, bouncing off ideas off of one another. So another keyword for this would be cooperation uh, towards a common goal or support. So you think about three legs of a stool, um, and you can also think about a chord. Um, I, I mentioned harmony and melody in, in my talk on the twos, and so here, now we have three notes, we can make a chord. Of course, um, three is a magic number, and in many uh, religions and spiritual paths, it is significant. And we have trinities of different kinds. We have Christian trinity, but um, you know, in Buddhism, we have the three jewels, for example. And the three jewels are our support just as it is for Christians, you know, it's um, Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit. Now, getting back to the keywords for a minute and this kind of imagery, okay, so that's all great. It's support, growth, and all those things, but then how do you reconcile that with, this, with these images? So if it's about support, then you have this idea of strength of the third thing coming in to kind of prop up the dualism of the two. Um, I mentioned having a third party um, in the Three of Cups, you know, a group of three people celebrating, um, or a group of three people working on a project together to support one another. And, you know, I think a lot of us struggle with this image with the Three of Swords, both because it's kind of boring, um, and it also stands out. There's a, there's just a couple of images in the Rider-Waite-Smith where you're like, where did that come from? Um, of course, we know this came from the Solobuska, and it doesn't actually really fit. Um, I really wish she had drawn three figures doing something here, because there's figures in the other cards. Um, but I can reconcile this Sorrow card um, with the idea of growth and mental and emotional crossover um, with the idea of painful insight. So an aha moment, a discovery, something that you realized where you're like, oh shit, that's what it is. That's the thing I have to do and I, now I don't wanna do it. Or, mm, that's the root of the problem. Or, you know, oh, I just heard a piece of information that gave me insight into why that happened. So that, that kind of thought that pierces your heart, the thought that triggers a strong emotional reaction, that's how I personally reconcile this image here. But I'd love to know how you, know, how you read these images and how you work with us. Um, if we look at the complementary card, of course we have 13 or death. And you know this is one time where the pairing really makes sense to me. If the inference is about um, life and abundance and pregnancy and fruition, then death is just the natural opposite of that. Um, and, you know, everything that lives um, and is sentient must die at some point. So that's the cycle of life. 
um, and it's pretty cut and dry. Of course, you know, th therefore, um, perhaps the, you know, the less um, favorable aspect of any of these cards could interpret it like, you know, a love triangle or maybe infighting among a group of friends or something or gossip, you know, two people talking about one person behind their back, that kind of thing. Um, maybe you're, you're, you know, you're not as strong as you thought you were, or you didn't get the support that you needed in that thing. Um, again, this this kind of insight being particularly difficult to deal with, or realizing, you know, maybe the realization is that the thing has to end. The thing that you were attached to that you thought you were going to grow into a project really needs to just come to an end. Um, and then, you know, death of, again, a working relationship or um, some kind of project uh, hits a dead end. So I can reconcile all of that pretty well. Um, in looking at the imagery for our threes, so in comparing imagery of other decks, I have the Star Seeker here, and we have the Three of Wands and the Three of Swords. And I like this Three of Wands a lot. Um, it's interesting that it's set at night, but we have a figure in a boat with three wands, and they're out on the water already. So they're not standing on the shore like this one but they're actually actively doing something. So they're taking that plunge, they're taking the next step, they're growing, and that kind of thing. Um, the Three of Swords here is just, you know, it's it's fairly symbolic in a similar way to the RWS image, but because it's not a pierced heart, you can kind of get away from that heartbreak keyword, which is what really drives me crazy. Um, and it, it, it becomes more of a mental formation. You know, your mind is being run through with this idea, this insight, this understanding that you've just gained, and now it's creating some emotions, it's creating some tears. Um, so I can, you know, I can work with that a little bit better. And then same thing here with this Three of Pentacles, also from the Star Seeker Tarot, you have the idea that each, it will take the talents and the skills and the resources of each of these three people to make the whole thing come together. That that one person or two people can't actually accomplish this by themselves. We need we need to be a group. Um, and kind of same thing here as in the Star Seeker, where you have hot air balloons taking off um, rather than um, you know someone standing uh, on the shore. So again, you need you know you need fire, you need air, you need ballast, um, you need the knowledge. You need a lot of different components to make these air balloons take off. And then one more set of comparisons. Again, some of my favorite cards from the Guy in Tarot. We have the Three of Earth here. We have three women um, of slightly varied ages uh, working together in a kitchen, making you know something. I don't know if they're cooking. They they have tincture bottle here here and a and a mortar and pestle. So I'm thinking they're making some kind of ointments or tinctures or something like that. Some kind of healing herbs. And then here for the Three of Air, probably one of my favorite Three of Airs um, out there. We have this guy writing in his journal. And so if we think about air and mental formations as going together with this, he's writing about his feelings. He's processing his emotions through words, and he's growing as a part of it. He's examining how he's feeling, thinking about it, writing it down, seeing if it's really, you know, if that's really true, um, or if he just has stirred up emotions about it. Um, he even has a little Three of Swords card here underneath the book. So you can you can think about, you know, he's done a tarot reading for himself and now he's journaling about that. And I just, I just love this card so much. Um, it's so rich and it's so apropos. You know, I, I can figure this so much easier into a reading than I can just this image uh, by itself. All right, and our last number for this uh, video is the number four. And of course we have the emperor here. So our keywords for the emperor are typically around stability and harshness and rule and war. And, you know, again, I think all those things can apply. I certainly see stability and rootedness as two of the main keywords. And, you know, those are both fairly neutral terms. I, I understand that culturally the idea of emperors and colonization um, and conquering and being violent and waging change through war is, you know, hugely um, terrible and problematic. Um, but I don't know that we have to always view the emperor that way in, in modern times. Certainly we have our own emperors and, and all of that stuff is still happening today. So that's the negative side of the emperor is that conquering mentality, that my way or the highway, you know, and ruling with an iron fist. But I think he can also represent you know, stability, support, and that kind of thing. So if we think about the most stable three-dimensional object that you can have is a three-sided pyramid, and you need four points to do that, right? You need, the, you need the base of the pyramid, and then you need the point on top. 
to, to make it three-dimensional. So um, we can think about four walls, the four, the four corners of our house, and then you can also think about common uh, number four sort of things in everyday life or in mythology, like the four corners of the earth, the four winds, the four directions, getting four of a kind in a, uh, you know, a game of poker or something like that, um, and the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Um, we can also think about, you know, the 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 downside again of this. Um, I'm, I'm reminded of the, you know, 1950s, 60s slang term square. You're a square. You're such a square, right? You're you're no fun. Um, you're a stick in the mud. You're too conservative. You don't know how to have a good time. Um, so that's that's the negative side. And certainly we can see some of that in here. Now I didn't put out my keywords immediately, but let me do that. All right, so once again, we have the Golden Dawn keywords, and um, here they really don't make sense too much with the pictures, um, I would say. Um, perfected work, Lord of Perfected Work, and we've got an image of some kind of a celebration. We've got a, a floral bower here and two people holding up bouquets. Um, this looks like some kind of, you know, I know a lot of people assume this is going to be a wedding, um, but it could be any kind of celebration is typically how I read this image. Um, Lord of blended pleasure. Uh, blended with what? You know, um, this guy is often interpreted in other tarot decks. Um, you know, he has a fairly neutral expression on his face here. I'm going to hold this up to the camera. Let me get my light on for you. Okay, so if you look at his expression, right? It's fairly neutral. I see him as meditating, being spaced out, daydreaming perhaps. I wouldn't necessarily call him like frowning or scowling, but in a lot of tarot decks, he's reinterpreted as having a very strong negative emotion, which is kind of weird. It's locking, it's locking in, you know, the meaning um, quite a bit more than I would want to. Rest from strife is interesting. I think on a lot of decks, this is just reinterpreted as a rest. And so you see someone like doing yoga or hanging out in their bed or something like that. But rest from strife specifically. So if swords, again, are the worst suit and they're about strife, this is like taking a break from arguing, taking a break from battling with someone, taking a break from uh, negative, you know, thought patterns. So that's kind of an interesting idea. It's like kind of calming yourself down from having a lot of overwhelming negative thoughts. Um, and then earthly power for the Four of Pentacles, um, and this guy is like standing on clutching and um, holding on to all four of his pentacles in a very protective way. He's got a crown and a fur and a, and a fancy robe on, so we think of him as being a rich person, a uh, wealthy person who's, you know, clutching at their material possessions. Um, in a bad way. And certainly, you know, the negative side of the emperor is is like that, right? It's the billionaires of the world. It's the conquerors. It's the it's the one percenters. But I also see this as being something where you are, you're simply trying to protest, protect your investments or, you know, hold, maybe hold on to what little you have. So there's always like room for interpretation here. You know, again, this guy, I don't know, could be ennui, could be just, you know, listening to your your headphones under a tree. And I'm, I'm not sure that it's necessarily a bad emotion or a negative emotion, um, but it could also be boredom. Um, I think that's stagnation, conservatism, again, stick in the mud, you're a square. That kind of energy can um, certainly come out depending on the reading. If we look at some comparative examples, I wanted to first look at this rest from strife idea. Um, and there are some better illustrated uh, takes on this, I think, in other tarot decks. So this is from the Cosmic Tarot by Norbert Loesch. Um, and here we have four guys sitting around. They've got food and drink here, and they're just kind of relaxing, and they've laid their weapons down on this, on this rug here. So it's kind of like, okay, let's all agree that we're going to stop fighting and have some tea together, and you know, maybe we'll talk it out in a more peaceful way. Um, I have another deck, the Kaishobu Tarot, that shows uh, people at, you know, they look like they're in a pub or something like that, and they're playing chess. And so I think of this were, this um, Four of Swords card as, you know, could represent something like stalemate as well. Um, so it's an interesting idea, is like rest, but rest from what? Another four imagery that I like, um, here we have the guy in tarot again, 
and these two cards, the Four of Water and the Four of Earth. So in the Four of Water, uh, this figure is gazing down into what looks like a well. You know, and there's no there's no risk of her falling in or anything like that because it's got a grate over it. She's just looking uh, and contemplating. So again, kind of if the water is still and deep, having that still and deep pause, that still and deep reflective emotional experience. You know, and again, it could be stag emotional stagnation, but it could also just be quiet, just being quiet and calm. And here on the Four of Earth, we have a very fat squirrel um, with all of his abundance uh, of cached acorns that he's, you know, saving up for the winter. So, you know, we all have periods where our contract on a job is running out and we're going to have some, some downtime between uh, employment, you know, or something like that. So we all have times when we need to save up our money, you know, or we want to buy something. We want to buy something that's expensive and so we need to save up for it. So I don't always you know, interpret the four of coins as being, you know, greedy and selfish. Certainly, if anything taken to extremes can can go in that direction. But I do also see this as, you know, self-protection and that kind of thing. And also taking care of others, you know, within your family circle. Um, so two more fours to look at. Uh, we have this um, four of fire from the fifth spirit tarot. And I just like the arrangement of this. It's four lamps and then around a central hearth. And so it's that, that idea of coziness, of, you know, having the, the protection and the, the space that you need in order to feel um, fulfilled, that kind of thing. Um, and then again, the Four of Swords from the Star Secret Tarot, um, one of my favorites uh, representations, it's a, it's a wind chime that's still. So, you know, it's the, the, the chimes aren't clanging into each other right now, at least I can't see that they're clanging into each other, um, but there's the potential for the wind to come along and just, you know, think about four swords um, making kind of a tinkling sound. And there's a rainbow back here. It's it's kind of subtle, but I think you can see that on camera. So it's a cloudy day. Uh, it's overcast, but everything is kind of still and calm. And again, going back to the two of swords as being listening, the four of swords can also be that, you know, be that pause, be that idea of... Uh, stable state of mind, you know, a restful state of mind, not an agitated one um, where you can just sit and contemplate or even just clear your mind and meditate. Now looking at our emperor versus our other card, which would be 14 temperance. It's an interesting combination here. Uh, you know, a good emperor, a good leader, a good ruler uh, will be temperate, uh, will be considered in their actions, will um, think about how their policies or their their investments uh, in their empire um, will play out and how, you know, how will that best support their people? How will it be the most fair for everyone? And how can they keep themselves from going to extremes, either, you know, being a lackadaisical ruler who, who doesn't provide any kind of structure or support for people or being a tyrannical one? Um, how can they be somewhere in the middle where they're responsive and helpful and you know providing uh you know you think about governments providing essential services um to people like health care and you know making sure there's a good uh fair housing market or things like that and then also how can they do that uh or, or say provide a good education but without censorship um certainly you know a topic that's hot right now so uh, it's an interesting combination and i i think i definitely think that temperance is required with the emperor, uh, particularly to kind of keep him in check and to make sure that, that things don't get tyrannical and out of hand. You know, I think temperance is really um, is really key with that. And it's interesting to think about um, structure and then each of the, the areas of life here. Structure for the things that you're passionate about or that you're invested in or that you want to improve or work on or make progress on. Um, having having good emotional regulation is how I kind of think of the positive aspect of the four of cups having good emotional regulation not freaking out about things um, you know being able to acknowledge your emotions and not judge yourself and saying okay I'm, I'm very angry right now that's interesting why am I having such a strong anger reaction to the situation um, what's what's pushing me there and you know is it really true is it really something that merits me getting getting that bent out of shape about you know the stability again of the mental state and being calm being able to clear your mind being able to not have overwhelming negative thoughts or 
um, overwhelming uh, disruptive thoughts. And then again, stability in our everyday lives, in our health, you know, not going to extremes in terms of, let's say if we have a health goal, not going on a crash diet, but, you know, approaching uh, approaching nutrition and stuff from more, a more holistic view, um, that kind of thing. So, so just to conclude, I want to look at the progression um, overall from the two to the four. And I've kind of hinted at a few of these things, but just to summarize, you know, in the two, we have this, this dualism, uh, this push and pull, this, this me and you, or this and that, and having to discern, um, and also having to listen. And then in the three, we get an opportunity to grow. Um, perhaps by inviting a third party to help us out, to join us uh, in this growth or to contribute something. Of course, um, three gets a little bit more complicated with coordination and that can become unbalanced. You can have two against one um, or infighting or that kind of thing as a negative response to three. Um, and three being a more active number, an odd number, um, you know, it can also be difficult. It can also be difficult to go through this process even when it's necessary and even if it's ultimately helpful, um, it can be tricky. And so when we get to four, we get to have kind of a calming down. Um, we get to more, get more into a stable uh, situation. Uh, we get to rest a bit, um, calm our emotions, calm our mind, maybe take a break from our passion project, you know, maybe just celebrate the win uh, rather than moving immediately into the next chapter of that really ongoing thing that we're working on. Um, or, you know, again, if we had to, if we have to grow um, in a, in a physical uh, material way, you know, maybe we can then um, save up some money after that um, to kind of replenish our savings account or uh, replenish our resources um, you know, this could be like letting a field go fallow after you've planted and harvested a crop. Um, then you let the field go fallow the next year so that it can rest and the nutrients can uh, regenerate. So um, I hope this was, um, I don't know, interesting and not like too rambly. Um, I really am trying to be cohesive, um, but there's a lot of things I want to share. And so these videos might be kind of... Uh, a little bit rambly and long. But anyway, thank you for um, being with me um, for this exploration and tune in next time for five, six, and seven. Until then, I'll uh, hope that you're well and I'll see you soon. Bye.